สวัสดีครับท่านผู้บริหารธนาคารกรุงเทพนะครับแล้วก็ท่านผู้แขกผู้มีเกียรติทุกท่านนะครับหลังจากที่เราได้ฟังเรื่องราวในเซสชันที่ผ่านมานะครับเกี่ยวกับเรื่องการลงทุนนะครับโอกาสในการลงทุนในอาเซียนนะครับมาในเซสชันนี้เนี่ยนะครับเราจะถอยมานิดนึงนะครับดูภาพที่ใหญ่ขึ้นนะครับลองดูกันว่าในเอเชียเนี่ยนะครับเราการลงทุนเนี่ยเป็นอย่างไรบ้างนะครับครั้งวันนี้เนี่ยมีความยินดีเป็นอย่างมากนะครับที่เราได้พาร์ทเนอร์ของเรานะฮะที่จะมาร่วมคุยกันนะครับพาร์ทเนอร์ของเราเนี่ยคือ Invesco นะครับซึ่งเชี่ยวชาญในการลงทุนในเอเชียนะครับซึ่งท่านผู้มีเกียรติคงทราบกันนะครับว่าในปีที่ผ่านมาเนี่ยนะครับผลตอบแทนในการลงทุนในตลาดเอเชียเนี่ยนะครับสูงนะครับสิกว่า 20% นะครับเราจะลองมาดูกันว่านะฮะว่าเอเชียเนี่ยมันร้อนแรงเกินไปหรือเปล่านะครับที่ผ่านมาเป็นอย่างไรนะครับแล้วมีปัจจัยพื้นฐานอะไรไหมที่ทําให้ผลตอบแทนเนี่ยมันสูงขนาดนี้นะครับแล้วคําถามที่สำคัญก็คือมันจะไปต่อได้หรือไม่นะครับโดยในระยะเวลาที่เหลือในปีนี้เนี่ยและในอนาคตนะครับจะดูว่าปัจจัยอะไรนะครับที่จะเป็นตัวผลักดันนะครับให้ตลาดเอเชียเนี่ยมันจะเดินตบโตต่อไปนะครับเราจะมาลองคุยกับเขาดูว่าประเทศไหนนะฮะหรือเซกเตอร์ไหนนะครับที่จะเป็นตัวที่จะน่าลงทุนนะครับแล้วก็เขามีมุมมองในการลงทุนอย่างไรนะครับขนาดเดียวกันนะครับความเสี่ยงนะครับก็เป็นสิ่งที่เราต้องคุยกับเขานะครับเพราะอย่างที่เราทราบกันดีว่าในที่ที่ผ่านมานะครับนอตคอเรียได้ลอนช์มิสไซล์นะครับผ่านไปเนี่ยในผลกระทบจะเป็นอย่างไรนะครับรวมถึงความท้าทายอื่นๆในแง่ของมอนิเตอรี่พอลิซีของทั่วโลกนะครับทั้งในแง่เฟดฟันนะครับในแง่ของ ECB ต่างๆเนี่ยมีผลกระทบต่อการลงทุนอย่างไรนะครับเพื่อให้เรานะฮะได้เห็น opportunity นะครับแล้วก็ capture นะฮะ investment opportunity in Asia นะครับเพราะฉะนั้นเดี๋ยวเราลองมาคุยกับเขาเลยนะครับมิสเตอร์จอนนะครับโอเคจอนเวลคัมทูแบงคอกขอบคุณมากเป็นความเป็นที่ดีที่ได้มาที่นี่ขอบคุณที่ได้รับการเชิญมาและก็ในส่วนของการเป็นอินเวสเตอร์ฉันอยากจะบอกว่าเราสัมพันธ์เป็นสิ่งที่เราคิดว่าเป็นสิ่งที่สำคัญและก็เราได้รับการเชิญมาที่นี่ขอบคุณมากขอบคุณที่ได้รับการเชิญมาที่นี่ขอบคุณมากขอบคุณที่ได้รับการเชิญมาที่นี่ขอบคุณมากขอบคุณที่ได้รับการเชิญมาที่นี่ขอบคุณมากขอบคุณที่ได้รับการเชิญมาที่นี่ขอบคุณมากขอบคุณที่ได้รับการเชิญมาที่นี่ขอบคุณมากขอบคุณที่ได้รับการเชิญมาที่นี่ขอบคุณมากขอบคุณที่ได้รับ You know, the first question that I would like to throw to you is that the market in Asia very really strongly in 2017. Is the market too hot? Yes, and uh, that is definitely a crucial question at the moment. Something that a lot of people are asking, um, and in fact, people like ourselves are asking the same question. Uh, but but let's put that into perspective. It's a question we ask all the time. <laughs> um, the, we have been through the cycles in uh, in Asia. Um, and I don't know if there's a slide here, but you can see that it's clearly a seen as a volatile region in terms of investment, and and so we always look and see whether there are going to be corrections. Whether it's too hot, um, it's difficult to say. Um, I think um, there are reasons why the market has gone up, and that is really crucial in trying to understand whether we should expect a correction or not. If there is a correction, I think. You know, as, and I'm not the only one to say this. Across the team, we spend most of our time looking for problems, things that might occur. That is our job, and so, um, so clearly, we would look for opportunities. If there was a corruption for us, it's a chance to um, to benefit from it. It could be an opportunity. Now, why, um, you know, for it to be more than a correction, I think we would have to see three things. First of all, we would have to see some. Um, Uh, uh, a real disruption regarding fundamentals. There. So there would be, there would have to be a discrepancy between valuations and fundamentals, and we are not seeing that at the moment. We we would also need to see some um, uh, complacency in the markets. So so when you see economies getting too confident, you start to see companies buy trophy assets. Uh, they start to buy football clubs, for example, or things like that. Um, so, you know, these are not investments that are necessarily profitable. So, those are the sort of things we'd be looking for. And at the moment, although there are exceptions, uh, we are not in the complacent environment. Uh, and finally, if I could just pursue, is is that uh, are we finding stock ideas in the market? I think that is the crucial thing, and we are still finding stock ideas. We do not think that everything is expensive. Um, so clearly, from that perspective, um, yes, there might be a correction, but it would be an opportunity for us. 
So how about like we talk about 2017, which is going up quite, you know, quickly and, yeah. and strongly. So how do you see the long-term experience for the investor who invests in Asia market? Yes, um, well, as you can see on this chart, uh, clearly we've gone through the crises. We've seen a few crises, things have picked up. Um, so far this year, uh, to come back to your question as well, is we've seen the returns in Asia at around 30% year to date. 30% in US dollar terms. If we go back to 2016, which was the trough of the market when people were concerned about China, uh, about the currency devaluation, um, since then the market has gone up 50%. And so, hence the question about whether it's too hot. But I think we have to step back and look further back, you know, three, five years. Uh, and over five years, I think the market is up 70%. Um, so we, we we are catching up basically from years of underperformance relative to the US and global equities. Um, and so, so that's the first thing to say. And fundamentally, I think we have to realize that there are reasons why the market has picked up. Uh, you know, the, the, if we go back to um, 2016, we had the Chinese devaluation. Uh, obviously, China has done everything to try to control its economy. Uh, we've got the conference coming up, and so they seem to be in much better shape in trying to control their economy, and, and markets have started to pick up. We have to remember that China is also responsible for the reflation that we have seen. Um, they uh, supported the property market in China, so it's quite critical. Uh, inventory in property has been coming down um, as a result of a pickup in sales, um, so that is good. Uh, for, 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 the, for the economy and for the market. Uh, and so they are clearly behind the reflation theme. They also have been cutting capacity uh, in industries like steel, cement, uh, and that is important because it means that um, these industries can become more profitable, but it also means that there's a pickup in demand, um, uh, particularly with the help of the property sector. And so we've seen material prices pick up uh, and that has helped uh, the, 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 um, the markets pick up. I think just to get back to the more long term, you know, we've been managing Asia since 1998. Uh, with the, so the fund that we have a partnership for uh, has been run since 1998. Uh, our performance has been um, at around 12% per annum throughout that period. So, so I think we are achieving our objectives in terms of generating returns for our uh, investors. And what we try to do is beat the market by 2 to 3% per annum, which is what we have been doing over the last few years. Um, so that is the context within which we are working. Uh, and I have to say that the last five years have been disappointing for Asia, and only over the last 18 months have we seen this recover. And so we're in a situation where we are looking for new opportunities. We're looking for areas that have underperformed and to see whether they are attractive. Uh, but so far, we continue to outperform. And, and I guess we can talk a bit about some of the areas that have done well. But that, that, is, that is sort of the setup at the moment. Okay. So like, okay, look like the, the longer term, uh, we managed pretty well. But let, let me get into the, the hard question. Like, do you expect the crisis or the crap, you know, around the corner? I mean, it like, you know, whether the, the valuation is duly justified. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah, I think that, that comes back to the earlier question where we were talking about, you know, are the fundamentals strong enough to support the rally that we've seen and to support the market going forward? And I think there's two things we would need to look at. The first one is earnings growth. And I think this is quite an interesting chart because what it shows is um, over the years, you can see that um, analysts every year have a projection for earnings growth for the region. And that is the dark blue bars. Uh, and as you can see, you know, in 2011, 2012, 2013, analysts were too optimistic about Asia, uh, especially at a time when global growth was slowing down. Uh, that affected exports coming out of Asia uh, and therefore affecting in some ways consumer demand as well. Um, and so earnings during that period were being downgraded, uh, as you can see. So that's where earnings growth ended, is the red 
uh, bars. So you can see it started with the blue bars at the beginning of the year, and where it ended is the red bars. And you can see we've seen downgrades over the last five or six years. Now, what is interesting is that with China supporting the economy, with the US starting to pick up, uh, global growth more generally starting to pick up, exports growth is in the double digits uh, in Asia. Uh, obviously, some countries are doing better than others. Uh, but throughout the region, we are seeing um, the region basically benefiting from better global growth, but also benefiting from the China stimulus that has happened. And this is being reflected in earnings. So if we look at 2017, uh, we have earnings growth of 15%, which is quite a big difference compared to what we've seen over the last few years. Uh, but more importantly, we've seen upgrades. So analysts are actually not optimistic enough uh, for this year. So we've seen earnings as the companies have come out with their results. Analysts have been readjusting uh, their earnings expectations. And so that's it. that is what we see with the 15% going to 20%. And actually, it's a bit lower, I think, on, on the chart, but actually it's around 20% now. And, and the real question, I guess, is you know, what do we expect for next year? Okay. Can we see this continue? And I think from our perspective, we cannot extrapolate 20% into 2018, 2019. It wouldn't be responsible of us. And also we have to realize where this um, pickup has come from. It's come from stronger fundamentals, but it's also come from a lower base uh, when we're comparing year to year numbers. And we don't think that will be as favorable for next year. So, um, so expectations for next year are around uh, 10%. Mm -hmm. And we think that is fairly reasonable. I think there is a pickup. Some companies are doing quite well. Consumer demand is still quite strong. In, in China, for example, retail sales are still around 10%. Um, so, so we don't think that is unreasonable. Yeah. And, and given that context, I think uh, from our perspective, you know, we only need to own 60 stocks sure. that we like out yep. of thousands that are available. Uh, we think we can continue to outperform. Okay. So it looks like the earnings have been upgraded, you know, from the, the like past couple of years that have been downgraded. But okay, earning upgrade, how about the valuation? Maybe whether like the market is already priced in or so what happened? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, the, the sort of valuations where we would start getting worried uh, is in going in the high, high uh, double digits. So, you know, the high teens, for example. And I think what we've seen so far is, um, is earnings growth pick up. Um, we have to remember where we started 2016. You know, if I talk about valuations, we were talking about 10%, um, uh, sorry, 10 times um, P ratio of 10 uh, times. Uh, we were looking at a price to book ratio of 1.2 times. Uh, and we were looking at, you know, relative to global markets, we were looking at a region that was at a 40% discount. So we, were st we started from what we can say, cheap valuations. Uh, and so this has recovered uh, clearly as a result of the fundamentals. And um, so that, that, that is the first thing to say. The question is, has it gone too far in terms of fundamentals? Well, earnings growth is still quite supportive. There's still some earnings momentum to come through. Valuations now are around 14 times earnings for the region, uh, about 1.6 times book value. And I would say that is, uh, on a PE basis, that is higher than historical averages, but only slightly higher. And on a price to book basis, it is lower than historical averages. So we're not talking about a market that's too hot okay. yet. Uh, but what is interesting is that, as you can see, as a discount um, to global markets, Asia is still quite attractive. So 28% uh, percent discount to global markets. Um, so just to put it into context, we think Asia deserves to be at a discount to global markets in general, but not the sort of discount we're seeing today. And it deserves to be at a discount because um, there is still uh, this perception in markets that uh, Asia is more risky, is more volatile. And the, so that is usually being factored into the, uh, the valuations. So it like, looks like still okay for, for the earning, for the valuation yeah. that, that, that uh, investors expect from this market. So how about the concern like last few, few weeks back that North Korea shoot yeah. the missile over the Japan? Like, how, 
investor yes. should be worried about this yes. and then uh, uh, and how you positioning this i think we're we're all worried about that um i think there's a there's obviously a view in the in the community uh that that wonders whether this uh you know, North Korean president is crazy, or he's acting as crazy, or he's uh, just saying things that are crazy. Um, so, I mean, that, that is obviously a very simplistic way of looking at things. I think what is happening is we have to put ourselves in the skin of the North Korean president. And uh, although we certainly don't condone the sort of actions that he's taking, uh, it's pretty negative. But we've been through these cycles of escalation, de-escalation, escalation, de-escalation. De so it's, this is not new. Obviously, this has come to a new level because we're talking about missiles, we're talking about uh, uh, bombs. Um, but I think if we put ourselves in the North Korean president's uh, skin, I think it's uh, clear to understand where he's coming from. I think what he's trying to do is uh, be a, a power compared to other countries. Uh, he realized that his only leverage against the US is, uh, is weapons. He's seen what's happened in Iraq, in Syria, uh, with Saddam Hussein and uh, Gaddafi in Libya. So he's seen that and he realizes that the, the only way forward is not to reduce uh, weapons, it's actually to increase. So we are seeing that. And, and he's trying to display that to, to the world. I think from our perspective, you know, obviously Korea, South Korea, is a market that, where we invest in, and, and, and it is the cheapest market in Asia. And one of the reasons is because of this, because of North Korea. Uh, there's another reason, which is corporate governance, but we can go through that, but, but one reason is cheap, is because people are concerned about North Korea over time. It's just sort of this overhang. Uh, that is there. Uh, but from our perspective, I think um, the US um, is, doesn't have a lot of leverage. Uh, it's going to be difficult uh, for them to de-escalate or denuclearize North Korea, even though a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the talk is about them trying to denuclearize. But I don't think that is going to change. I think they've got a, a way forward. But I also don't think he's suicidal. We don't think he's going to use these. I think it's more as a negotiating argument to come back to the table uh, to say, yes, now we are a power. Now we need uh, to be recognized as a nuclear power. I think it's more about that. And one of the, um, uh, I guess, you know, the worst outcome is obviously for North Korea to attack anybody. And, or the US to attack North Korea, because that would mean that North Korea could attack Seoul, which is not very far. Uh, and if North Korea attacks, then clearly the US would have to retaliate. So that would be the worst case scenario, but we think it's a very low probability, because we think that both sides, um, it's all about deterrent, uh, deterrent, trying to avoid conflict in the future, try to avoid being um, manipulated by the other in, in the case of North Korea. So I think we, we will, oh, it might get worse in the short term, yeah. but we could de-escalate over time. Okay. Right, so you okay with that? So we think it's low possibility to happen in that way? Yes, I, I, don't, I don't believe in the worst case scenario. Okay, okay. How about any other challenge that we have right now, like the debt in China or the um, monetary policy that, you know, is going to be increased, uh, the yeah. tightening monetary policy for the developed market, you know, so how like this challenge that um, we impact and, and how you positioning this one? Yeah, no, the, the, the good questions because they're, they're obviously the two factors that uh, are responsible in some way uh, on the valuation attractiveness of Asia. So if there weren't any issues, if there weren't any concerns about Chinese debt, about uh, interest rates, the US dollar, um, Asia would be a lot more expensive. And so in some ways, this is bringing valuations down, give, providing us an opportunity uh, to be a bit more selective when we invest. Um, but anyway, first point you mentioned was the Chinese debt situation. Uh, that is clearly uh, an issue in the sense that Chinese debt has increased over the last few years. So it's gone from 150% of GDP in 2008 to around 270% uh, now of GDP. Most of that is in the corporate sector. Actually, the government debt is quite low in China. So most of that is in the corporate sector. And within the corporate sector, it's largely in the state-owned enterprises. It's in um, the local government vehicles. 
uh, that have been lending very strongly to develop infrastructure. So in some ways that debt, hopefully most of it is productive, but some of it is not productive and that is where we need to be concerned. Um, and the second issue is obviously the growth of that debt has been quite strong. So typically emerging markets run into trouble when debt uh, grows too fast. Uh, and also when it is funded by external debt, so it's funded by foreigners. I think the advantage in China is that it is funded by deposits, mm. by Chinese deposits. So although there's high debt, there's also high assets. Uh, and that's because the Chinese, um, you know, they, they save a lot. They save 30% of their income mm -hmm. and that goes into the banks, which are used as deposits and therefore the banks could roll that over into, into new lending. So, um, so from that perspective, we are less concerned than perhaps the market, mm -hmm. but I, we still think we need to be concerned in terms of selecting the right sectors because the state-owned enterprise uh, companies, mm -hmm. are, some of them are struggling from this high level of debt. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why we are more sanguine or more confident that China can manage this transition from high debt um, is that um, a lot of that debt, obviously, as I said, is funded by deposits, so the loan to deposit ratios is around 100%. And our emerging markets usually run into crisis when that is around 130%. So there's a long way to go still. Um, the other thing that China has, which other emerging markets didn't have necessarily in the past, is they have a closed capital account. Uh, and so they can sort of uh, control the outflows of money. Now, clearly, we've seen leakages. Uh, you know, two years ago, we saw leakages, people trying to take their money out. But the Chinese government has really clamped down on that. Um, and, uh, and finally, I think there is, uh, from our perspective, we have to be very selective. And we can see that there are parts of the Chinese economy, even though there are parts that are uh, finding it difficult, like the state-owned enterprises, companies in steel, cement, uh, um, you know, material sector is, is struggling. There is a consumer sector, which is very strong, uh, which is, um, you know, we might talk about a few stocks, but some companies are growing their revenues 50% year on year. And that is the area where we are more focused on. So yes, we understand the issues uh -huh. in parts of China, but we are focused on some of the areas of strength in China. Okay, so like the, the, the debt might be the, the uh, unique collector for the China market and also the, uh, the ecosystem is quite unique. And yeah. then because you are looking for the company that benefit, not like get into yeah. that, that trouble, okay. How about yeah. the interest rate in dollar? How, how you view on that? that uh, and yes, the US dollar, that is um, obviously Asia has benefited from a, a falling US dollar over the last uh, few quarters. Uh, uh, and the fear would be that the US dollar would start to increase again uh, dramatically. Uh, and therefore, this is basically this acts as a drain on liquidity uh, throughout the, the, the region. Um, now, one of the issues is uh, of a rising US dollar is that if you have a lot of debt on your balance sheet, then your debt goes up uh, as the US dollar goes up. Now, fortunately, a lot of companies we invest in are mostly net cash on the balance sheet. Um, but I think to see the US dollar really go up from here, um, we'd have to see some, probably some more improvements in the US. We'd probably have to see uh, the promise, you know, the Trump promises, which were <laughs> tax cuts, infrastructure, uh, would have to come back on the table. It looks like that is increasingly difficult uh, to get these through. Obviously, they are running into problems at the moment with their debt issues in, in, in you know, they need to increase the debt ceiling. Yep. Uh, so they need to start with that, I guess, to, to, to push forward any infrastructure or reform. One thing I would mention, though, is um, the infrastructure, which is one trillion US dollars uh, that Trump would like to push forward in the US, uh, represents about nine months of Chinese infrastructure. So okay. the U.S. would like to do that over the next few years. Uh, mm -hmm. It only represents nine months. Uh, so, nine months. Okay. so I think it's quite interesting to, you know, when you're looking at uh, the reflation trade, mm -hmm. um, it's not all about the U.S. Uh, it's yeah. a lot about China. Okay. All right. So, so that means like we, we can see that, you know, this year and the following quarter is okay. But 
just want to check with you on the what is the main theme for investment like from the rest of the year and in 2018 and yeah. forward so how you view the, the outlook of this the Asia market yeah I think I mean we have to step back also again and, and look at Asia for for its strengths so Asia represents 40 percent of global GDP um, it represents 60 uh, percent of GDP growth throughout the world you know, it's quite a solid region. Uh, and despite this, it is only around 10% of people's portfolios. Uh, global equity portfolios have around 10% perhaps in Asia. Um, so there is some catching up to do there. Uh, the, the, the other element, I was looking at an IMF report, uh, which suggested that the next billion people that were gonna emerge into the middle class, 90% uh, will come from Asia. And it's not surprising, given some of the, um, the things that we've been hearing earlier in the speeches. You know, we're Indonesia, China, mm -hmm. India, these are all emerging economies uh, with a young population and can really spur growth going forward. So, so the premium of growth that exists uh, in Asia yep. has been slowing, uh, but there's no reason for that premium to disappear. Uh, I think the growth drivers are still there. Yep, yep, yep. Any specific country or sector that you would like to mention? So we know that this is the opportunity or, you know. Yep. Yeah, so uh, clearly uh, we've talked a lot about ASEAN and we are invested in some countries, in, in companies ASEAN. in yep. ASEAN, okay. uh, absolutely, and uh, in, in the five different countries. Um, but I think where we have focused our attention over the last few years, but also now, um, is in China to start with in India, in Korea, and Taiwan, and I'll explain a bit of that. I think to start with China, um, I mentioned that there was the new economy and the old economy, which is basically the industrial side, which has been slowing down, where capacity cuts have been happening. Um, we have been invested in the new economy, the companies that are benefiting from smartphone adoption. Now. Um, I'm sure some of you in this room have at some point bought something while someone was speaking here on your smartphone or talked to members of your family. This is something that was inconceivable a few years ago. And, you know, we talk a lot about Asia copycats uh, compared to the US or et cetera, but it's completely different when we look at China and the smart smartphone penetration. Uh, you look at the new companies in China, um, they have evolved their own smartphone, uh, internet ecosystem. Mm -hmm. and, and so a lot of companies are benefiting from that. So you have Tencent, which has WeChat, mm -hmm. uh, Baidu, which is like the Google of China. You have Alibaba, e-commerce, which is the biggest seller of goods uh, in the world, um, benefiting obviously from the Chinese consumer, but looking to expand. Uh, and hopefully from our perspective, they will be expanding profitably. You know, that is the main concern for us. Um, and then you have companies like Netties, which basically um, they offer games online. So if you're on your smartphone and you want to play with your friends at the same time, Netties is the sort of company that develops those games. And the two chart, there's a chart here that shows two stocks that have done particularly well. Okay. Now, two of these stocks we've owned, so they are called Tencent and Netties. And, and the obvious question looking at this is, have they run too far? And so what we have been doing throughout this process is reducing our exposure, taking profits, and recycling that into other ideas. Now, there's plenty of other ideas because okay. the smartphone uh, situation mm. and internet is just expanding. And so we're finding new companies, uh, and, and actually these are the best performers over the last few years, okay. but the best performer this year for us is other companies which are at the bottom of the list there, uh, which have started to pick up. So what we're trying to do is take profits, recycle that into new names, uh, yeah. and so this is what we're trying to do in China. So in fact, our weighting in China hasn't changed very much, oh, right. but we've changed the stocks within the portfolio, okay. uh, trying to take advantage of, of the fact that some companies have done perhaps too well in the uh -huh. short term. Okay. Uh, and other situations we've found is that these stocks can be volatile. So we found ourselves in situations where the stock has rallied quite hard, we took profits, and then it started to fall. We started adding back 
okay. to the stock because we know the company very well. Oh. We know their earnings, the prospects. Adding back, so it goes up again, we take profits. So I think that is just the rational way of doing things when we invest in, in companies, is try to take profits when we okay. can okay. And, uh, and reinvest. So that's what we've been doing in China. Now, in India, which I think is the next slide, India is a different story because it's one of the most expensive markets in Asia. Uh, but we understand why. We understand why the, the, the structural strength, the structural growth of India is uh, much higher than elsewhere. Um, it's seen as the fastest growing large economy in the world. Okay. Uh, but in the short term, it's had a few hiccups. Uh, mm. Obviously, it's been trying to reform. Yep. We see that as a good thing, uh, but the market doesn't always see that as a good thing. Sometimes okay. the market is disappointed by, for example, demonetization, yep. that's where they yep. took the money out and replaced that. Most of that money has come back to the banking system, actually, yeah. but okay. it's meant that the banking system is more liquid, uh, they've been able to lend. Um, India is one of the, f well, is one of the only uh, large emerging economy now which is very early in its credit cycle. Oh, so okay. most economies are later in the credit cycle. We've seen that with the banking results, where you see non-performing loans coming through, uh, assets, some of them are discovered as bad. Mm. Um, and so banks have been trying to uh, recover that from that. In India, they also have been through this process, but they're towards the end of that. And, and when you look at debt levels in India, it hasn't increased over the, since 2008. Most wow. of economies have seen their debt increase. Yep. In India, it stayed flat. So they are the early stages of their credit cycle. Okay. And that means that you know, higher loan growth, uh, better profitability at companies, okay. new projects, uh, with reforms like mm -hmm. demonetization, yep. uh, the goods and sales tax, as they okay. call the GST, yep. which is trying to harmonize the tax system across the country, mm -hmm. rather than have different taxes in different states. Um, so we're seeing that happening now. Now the market is a bit cautious about this, uh, but for us it's opportunities because in the long run we think India has the potential. Um, and so we are overweight India. Hmm. Um, it represents around 13% of the portfolio. China is around 20% of the portfolio. Okay. Um, the next idea is the cheapest market in Asia. Cheapest and that is, okay, what is that? Uh, and that is That's Korea. Korea? Yeah, I already mentioned Korea. Uh, obviously, North Korea is part of uh, the reason for that. But I also mentioned corporate governance. Now, corporate governance is basically, are the companies yep. acting in the best interest of shareholders like us? Yep. And in the past, um, Korean companies have preferred to keep cash on the balance sheet rather than pay it out as dividends. They prefer to use the cash for the business. Um, now, foreign investors, usually when there isn't a lot of growth, mm. like, in, like Korea, prefer that cash to come back to them yeah. as dividends. And what we are seeing is developments in Korea, and, and actually this is one of the reasons why Korea is one of the cheapest markets. So if you believe that things are going to change in South Korea, uh, then you could see the re-rating of the market. You could see valuations start to pick up. And this is what we're seeing now. So, Korea, not very long ago, was below book value. So basically, the assumption there is that it will not grow. Companies will not be able to grow their earnings. Uh, that is very pessimistic, in our view. So we've been taking positions in Korea. We've been overweight uh, Korea. And it's obviously in specific companies. Uh, but corporate governance has gradually been improving. So you look at Samsung Electronics, uh, which might be the producer of this screen, by the way. Um, it's been very strong in uh, display handsets, obviously. There's probably a lot of people that have Samsung phones here. But more importantly, in the, in the recent past, Samsung has gone up around 80, 90% over the last year. And that is because uh, of semiconductors. It is the global leader in semiconductors, in chips, and therefore uh, they have benefited from that. Some people forget sometimes that Samsung is quite diversified and has many different businesses that are doing quite well. Now, Samsung not only is doing well, but has also signaled, and we could see that as an example for the rest of the market, signal that uh, they will be paying out more of their cash to shareholders. Mm. So Samsung generates a lot of free cash flow. 
and typically they would sort of hold on to that, perhaps acquire a company. Mm. Um, what they've done now is continue to acquire companies in the um, automotive space, yeah. so car electronics, for example, moving from smartphones to car electronics. And, and what they have done is pay out, promise investors to pay out 50% of their free cash flow, mm -hmm. which is quite a big uh, development. They've also promised that they will keep, they will have no more than a certain amount of cash on the balance sheet. Okay. Also, because the government uh, is taxing cash okay. on the balance sheet. So the government is pushing these companies to pay out more. Mm -hmm. The National Pension Service uh, in Korea, okay. which has a lot of pensioners, sure. uh, and this is an aging population, so pensioners need their pensions, to and they rely family. on these companies to pay dividends. And so the National Pension Service, which owns around 6% of companies like Samsung Electronics, sure. are putting pressure. So the investors are putting pressure, National Pension Service is putting pressure, the government is putting pressure, and the companies are coming out with policies which are much more shareholder friendly. So that is supportive, we think, for the share price, yep. and, and supportive in terms of m reducing the discount that Korea has so not like because of the geopolitics that get the valuation is yes. getting discount, more kind of uh, corporate structure and how yeah. they, you know, manage their own company. Exactly. This is this is something that was uh, being discussed before we had oh, the issues about the, okay, North Korea. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and they, actually, and Korea has been one of the best performing markets this year, despite what is happening in North Korea. So I think the market is brushing off okay. the North Korea issue and focusing mm -hmm. on the fundamentals. Any other country that uh, you think? And finally, given where markets are, you know, they've gone up 50%, um, I think we have to be responsible and try to protect the uh, returns that we have made over the last few years. And so we've been trying to look for areas that haven't done so well, that have, offer some defensiveness um, in case of a correction, um, and, and where simply the fundamentals are good. And where we have found that is in companies that have net cash positions on their balance sheet, uh, and particularly those that they might have a high PE ratio, but we think that the market is overemphasizing the PE and should be looking on the free cash flow yield. So how much these companies are actually generating in cash. And, and so we found that Taiwanese companies, uh, particularly in the tech sector, have been generating a lot of cash. Uh, this is part, I guess, of the technology theme. You know, technology, you've got uh, hardware, software, internet, uh, I mentioned smartphones, and, and obviously all the components that go into that. Well, there's a lot of companies in Taiwan uh, that benefit from this theme, and, and a lot of them have net balance sheets, uh, net cash on, on balance sheets. So we, we've, we actually bought a company the other day, and I won't mention the name, which had about 80% of its market cap in cash. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're basically buying the company for free if you think uh, that it's gonna it. make money and okay. it's gonna return that to you at some point in the future. So again, we're finding that on a PE basis, because mm -hmm. its earnings are not very high, because it's investing, uh, on, a, on a PE basis, uh, it looks quite expensive. Okay. But on a free cash flow yield and on a balance sheet basis, it looks uh, pretty cheap. So that's the sort of things we've been buying into, a few Taiwanese names. Uh, and we've realized that this theme is basically across the portfolio. Okay. So we find this undervalued balance sheet theme across the Chinese internet names. Uh -huh. uh, we find them in Taiwanese tech. We find them in Samsung. Samsung is also a company that has a very strong balance sheet. So basically, uh, that's why I like to talk it as a theme. Okay. It's become a theme in the portfolio. So okay, I can be more defensive as well at, you know. And yes, and it can act as a more defensive um, exposure uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. as people focus on the balance sheets when, okay. when things become more difficult. Okay, okay. Um, right, so try to kind of uh, balance between the, the growth and then the one that kind of expensive and then if you know the company quite well, so if they have yeah. any, you know, hiccup, we can get in you know, buy that company and then the defensive kind of yeah. uh, theme. So uh, maybe the, the last question, uh, what was the, some of the new innovative development that uh, happening in Asia that you would like to share with us? Uh, 
Uh, yes, I, I, would, I would say two things. Okay. The first one is uh, the reduction of risk. So I know we talk about a lot about debt. Um, I think one of the developments that we need to keep a close eye on is Chinese debt, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but also what are they doing about it? And I think what is interesting about uh, the situation in China is that usually you run into a crisis when you are not aware that you have a problem. Uh, China is very aware okay. that it has a problem uh, in terms of debt. And they are also aware that uh, in some ways this credit growth has been engineered okay. by the government. Mm -hmm. And so they're aware of the situation. And I think that's a good start. Uh, and so what they are doing about it is a lot of the money that has gone into infrastructure building and therefore in some sectors having too much infrastructure, like again, steel, cement, uh, and, and what they're doing about it is they are cutting capacity. Uh, so if you look at China, for, if you look at steel, for example, uh, they have cut capacity by about 10% over the last few years. Now, if we assume that over capacity is around 30% mm -hmm. in China, uh, in steel, in uh, iron ore, the miners, um, and they're cutting that by another 10% uh, in steel and iron ore, that is a positive development. So to put that into numbers, they have cut 50 million tons of steel capacity okay. over the last year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're meeting the target, because they have a target. Okay. Uh, in terms of coal, they have cut capacity by 150 million tons. Okay. And so they are clearly doing something about it. And I think that is a good development because it's, it's reducing the risk uh, over time. Mm -hmm. So we've already started to see that being tackled. And the second point I would mention in terms of innovations okay. is, uh, is, again, the smartphone adoption. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is a very, very positive development. Uh, there's been a whole debate about Chinese internet companies uh, doing well against the U.S. companies doing well. And a whole debate about whether the U.S., you know, Amazon, Facebook, oh, right. okay. uh, yeah, Google, yeah, yeah. whether they are overvalued. And compare that to Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent. Uh, and, and I find it very interesting that um, when we look at the Chinese companies, they have better growth, they are on a lower valuation, mm -hmm. and, and also when you look at a company like Tencent, which has done extremely well, um, they, are, they have not over monetized their user base. So they have, I think, about 700 million users on their platform, um, and they have been very cautious about not uh, basically bothering them too much. Sure. Uh, so, so they try to monetize that over time, but they haven't over monetized, mm -hmm. which, which in the West, I think, in, you know, in the US companies, they have really clearly monetized a lot of their consumers already. Um, so clearly they've still got a lot of growth and mm -hmm. they're quite dominant in their space. Okay. So there's no denying that. And, and in some cases they deserve to be on a higher valuation okay. for that. Uh, in China, it's the same issue, but they have, on top of that, they have the ability to monetize a bit more. Okay. Um, so I think those are the developments. And, and from our perspective, all we can do is really try to find the best company okay. in some of these sectors, in e-commerce, in, uh, you know, in, in the way people change their habits in terms uh -huh. of shopping habits. Okay. Uh, how do you benefit from that? And I think a lot of that will come from technology companies. It's difficult okay. to dissociate technology companies and innovation. Mm -hmm. they, they come together now. Okay. So these are areas that we've been focusing on. We're overweight technology. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it doesn't mean that will always be the case okay. but if it becomes too expensive. But yeah, for the time being, we still think it's, uh, okay. it's an attractive place to be looking for ideas. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much, John. I think that, uh, that wrap up the, the ASEAN market that, uh, you know, the variation now is, is, is okay with all the factors that you see and also with the different, like, uh, geographic that uh, China, India, Korea, and... Um, Taiwan that the, the company tried to kind of seek for the, the company that, uh, that have benefit, you know, and also with um, the new development that happening, you know, the company tried to find and capture that opportunity uh, to happen in the future in technology. All right. Thank you very much. And please give a round of applause for John. Thank you very much. Thank you.